Hello. In this lecture, we'll, we'll look at early medieval art, uh, specifically art of the northern regions of Europe, uh, where the farthest edges of the Roman Empire had been, places today of Great Britain, Ireland, um, Finland and Norway, and Scandin other parts of Scandinavia. Um, we will discuss and examine the older pagan influence and traditions that um, predated the Roman Empire, specifically the uh, level of abstraction in their design um, and the intricacy and quality of, their, of that design um, and how important that was, um, more so than the um, influence of Roman culture, which we'll see some of, but primarily uh, in the art of this region uh, during the early medieval, um, we don't see the grand gestures that were typical of Roman culture. Um, these people tended to favor uh, smaller, uh, more complex, and yet uh, uh, less um, uh, less in terms of, of uh, less of an, a focus and interest on uh, size and scale. Now. The reason why these people favored the, this type of art in, in their culture has a lot to do with um, their social structure. Um, these are the people who were, before the Romans, were the descendants of the Celts and Druids. Um, and at the time of the Romans and just after, they... Um, they had, there's no centralized government, and as such, um, their their goal was to um, to try and increase their individual small group clan uh, prestige and wealth um, over a uh, an empire building approach. Now. Um, we commonly refer to these peoples today as the Vikings. Um, that's, that's how they were, they'll come to be known. Um, and as such, what we know about their, um, their lives and their society, um, we see reflected in their culture. Um, they were a seafaring people. Uh, they were a, um, you know, they tended to... Uh, try and expand their wealth through shipping and trade, but also through um, the use of force to you know, dominate their enemies and their neighbors. Uh, and so instead of investing in large scale public buildings or palaces or structures like that, that, you know, might've been more common in the Roman times, um, these, these folks in their culture favored smaller, um, more intricate works. Um, they favored the, the quality of their uh, craftsmanship in their designs. Um, and we see that in, in their approach to just about everything that they did artistically. Now, some of, the, some of that influence of the early church uh, is, is still at work, but in these regions, these um, these church uh, leaders and church the church influence in the region is really more uh, of a missionary um, activity than it is of a ruling activity or a dominant activity. So the the manuscripts that we see and the objects that remain from this uh, time in this place they tend to reflect the goal of the church to influence these pagan peoples to uh, convert to Christianity. And conversion uh, and the, the culture created towards conversion is different than um, a people who have already accepted Christianity and are expressing a, a faith that is already 
um, you know, common in society. So when we see their manuscripts, when we see their sculpture, what we're seeing is the result, uh, especially when it's expressing Christianity, the result of that conversion. And we're seeing the, um, the combination of their new faith with their traditions. So this is a page from uh, one of the most famous manuscripts of the early, early medieval, and uh, it's called the Lindisfarne Gospels. Now, um, these prayer books, like we've talked about in previous lectures and previous manuscripts, um, they were not what kind of what we would think of as a Bible. They were, uh, so when, if it's referred to as a gospel, it's intended to tell the story of Christ. Um, and But the goal here is to communicate that message to people who are not familiar with Christ or his stories and who are not already believers and to try and help to try and convert them into believing. Um, so what they need to see in these stories is not just the nature of Christ and the relationship between Christians and Jesus, which is what we would have seen commonly in the art of the, uh, the southern part of the empire, but now it's going to be telling stories, and that's why Gospels are favored, telling the stories of Christ's life and relating them to um, the belief systems that were already commonly held by the people. Now, this is what's called a carpet page. And um, so a carpet page would have been a not quite an illumination, it's more of a, a decorative element that divides the, the, the pieces or text within a manuscript. Um, you can see the cross motif. Um, you can see uh, the in intricacy of the design. Um, and when we examine these uh, designs, we see the some of the kind of Byzantine style influence of geometry, but also we see um, some of their older traditions. These um, highly intricate curved line motifs that you see repeated throughout in the yellow and orange background, those are what are known as Celtic knots. Now, a Celtic knot design um, predates the Roman Empire in the region by uh, centuries. And it was, um, it's part of their older, more, uh, their older pagan belief systems, whereby um, these, they believed that these lines were a, uh, had the power to ward off evil spirits. And so if a, a demon or an evil spirit um, was, uh, you know, came into contact with these lines that they would have to undo them. Um, they were binding, basically, uh, against those spirits. Now, um, so by incorporating those in the background of this motif or this design, um, what the, the people who saw this and came in contact with it would have recognized those and would have... Um, seen those as being, um, uh, having that power, that older um, power in belief that they held. Now, the, they incorporated these motifs, these designs of the knots into a variety of things, not just manuscripts. We see it in their carving. We see it in their, um, in, in some of the architecture. And, um, in all instances, when we see a, a design like that, it's uh, that that's it's that symbology of warding off that evil um, that it's that that's what's supposed to represent. Now, uh, in other illuminations within this manuscript in Linda's Farm Gospels, we see attempts to um, give kind of validity to the message. So this is an image of the gospel writer, Mark, and his, um, and his receiving the message of the gospel 
um, from this bird that flies in with the book, and the bird has a halo, and Mark has a halo. Mark's dressed and depicted as a Roman, seated on a Roman bench, and he's, um, and the bird is actually supposed to represent the the dove of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about it is is that it they they equated these peoples equated the that bird. It's not really supposed to be a dove; it's supposed to be an eagle, and that was a symbol of the Roman Empire. Because for these people, they equated um, the church with the empire. Because as the empire transitioned to Christianity, um, you know, these people saw didn't see a difference between the empire and the church. Now, um, this uh, these illuminations again were used to to show the uh, the history of Christianity. And the history of the church, and to help uh, help missionaries to transform and and to convert uh, the former pagans into you know, into Christians, into believers. Now, um, the details are, uh, and, and when you look closely at these pages, what we find are that the details are quite intricate. Uh, they show uh, a high level of skill in the line work, in the color work, um, but for the most part, the images tend to be very graphic and flat. We don't see a high level of perspective or of uh, realism in modeling. That, that won't come until later. Um, a lot of that has to do with the turning away of older pagan traditions in terms of how to make imagery. Now, there are certain certain subject matter details that were still allowed um, and that were cultivated because of their um, their ability to uh, to influence a greater level of belief. But in terms of you know looking at pagan influence or pagan um, directions on how to how to depict the form, looking at Greek and Roman sources and mimicking those, that was no longer acceptable. Now, this is also the beginning of what we would really see as a traditional graphic design. Using letters instead of just symbolic pictures or, or uh, figurative pictures or abstractions of animals, which were quite common, but using levels as actual design elements and it, making these these uh, letters um, more and more intricate, um, and in, so that really becomes uh, an important part of this uh, this visual tradition in the region, and we'll see that develop uh, over the the medieval. Now, um, pages like this were used not only to uh, expand the um, the interest in uh, in the church but also uh, these these books were quite often used to show the skill and quality of the illuminator um, and his ability to um, to come up with different designs that were unique and, and showed off his skills in fact Many illuminators, master illuminators of the time period, would carry with them these uh, illuminated manuscripts that uh, that show their show off their skills as kind of a sample book. And as they traveled around, and their you know they would they would meet patrons who would give them uh, who would you know uh, uh, commission them to create a manuscript for them. And they could then choose the style of lettering, the style of illumination, the style of designs um, from their sample books. The sample books would be added to over and over. They would be kept in the illuminator's possession for years and years. And they would add to them uh, different ideas as they developed them. Um, and then that's partly why some of these books are so, so elaborate, because they show off 
all the different range of skills, all of what, for that illuminator's talent and, and uh, from their perspective, what was possible. Now, um, we have very little left in terms of uh, architecture or sculpture from the period because, uh, one, they didn't, they just tended to favor um, not building large scale stone masonry stru type structures. These are people who built mostly from wood and they were also, they moved around a lot. They, they traveled a lot. And as such, um, they, they didn't, um, they didn't build large scale cities. They built small villages um, and they moved from place to place as necessary. This object is, uh, is quite rare, and it's only uh, survived because the king, whose uh, funeral boat this is, um, or was, um, he had converted to Christianity. And as such, um, the pagan tradition of cremation instead of burial uh, was not something that Christianity allowed. Christianity required burial, and, but he was a king, and so there they... Kings had burial traditions. Um, the a, a a Viking king would have had a funerary boat like this one, a very intricately carved boat um, that would have been packed with all of his prized possessions at his death, and then his body, uh, anointed and wrapped for burial, would have been placed on the ship, and the ship placed afloat. Uh, on either on a lake or a river, and then set on fire. And as the ship burned, that would have signified, and his body burned, and all his possessions burned. He would have, that would have signified his crossing over into the afterlife. Well, because this king had um, had converted to Christianity, uh, that required burial. He wanted to be buried as a king. So this is um, this is his funerary ship. It was found buried in a bog uh, in Osberg, Norway, um, and it's uh, it really did give us a great deal of insight into their traditions of, one, the, the ship itself is a, a unique object because it's really one of a kind. We know what their ships looked like. We know um, that they were ma master sailors and oarsmen. Um, we know that that they could travel great distances on ships like this, including traveling from northern Europe to the Americas. Um, these are the first Europeans to visit America, probably um, commonly visiting between you know, as early as maybe 700, 750, um, and then traveling back and forth um, regularly, the first and, and, permanent or semi-permanent encampments in the North America from uh, by these these Europeans would have been in the 9th and 10th and uh, into the 11th century. We know that, that these people visited on ships like this one. Now, when you look carefully at the ship, you see the fine detail of the carving. Um, all along the edges of the ship, the bow, the stern, the, uh, the, the carving, the relief carving, of the of these abstract animal forms, um, the pattern forms, they really show off the high level of skill uh, of these these craftsmen as they uh, they applied that to um, you know the decorative elements of this ship. Now, one of the things that you know these people had learned from the Romans, you know, the, the Romans were influential in, in more ways than just religion, but one of the things that they had learned from them was the power of a story uh, and an art, an image related to that story to communicate propaganda. Um, they used this propaganda, they used these stories to influence both uh, their people and their enemies. So, um, you know, these are the, the people who created the a lot of the legends and legendary characters and figures and and um, and you know sea monsters, unicorns, 
dragons. Um, these are the, the people who created those, and they use those for great effect. Um, so, you know, they would spread the word, basically, that uh, there were sea creatures of uh, terrible power and, and you know, that, to be avoided uh, in places where they didn't want their, uh, you know, their enemies to go. Um, that same thing, a you know, great example is uh, calling Iceland, Iceland and Greenland, Greenland, because, you know, you're not going to want to go to Iceland and you're not, you're going to want to go to Greenland and Greenland is very icy and Iceland is very green. And so it kept people away. And that's sort of the point, right? Is that if you tell the story and you're, you know, whether you tell it in words or in visuals, it can be influential in the way that people uh, react. So some of these motifs that you see reflect some of those stories. Those abstract animal forms are supposed to represent some of those sea monsters and sea creatures. This is a carved uh, Elkhorn antler uh, handle for a dagger. This is a very small object. It's been gilded. Uh, that's the gold color. It's been inlaid with, uh, with diamonds and precious stones that are polished and faceted. Um, it is... Uh, it's a high level of in intricacy in the carving. Um, all those carved lines are that represent those same Celtic knot motifs that we saw in uh, in the illuminations. And so this kind of shows off their attitude towards um, the decorative. They favored the small, intricate quality uh, of of carving, high level of quality of carving over the big grand gestures. The forms are abstracted, they're simplified, they're stylized, um, and there's an element there of that legendary, of that fantasy um, and mythical to that. And so it's not realism in the same sense of classical realism. It's a, you know, there's a purpose behind um, every form, every design. Now, very often we'll see um, artworks and media and, and subject matter and content that is universal. But from time to time, there are also elements that are very, very unique. And this is one of them. This is something unique, initially unique, to Ireland. Um, but then as the Irish move, first across Great Britain and then eventually uh, to America, they bring it with them. Uh, this is what's known as a high cross. Now, you'll see in the, the overall picture, there are several of these high crosses. And this is these were placed in the courtyard area outside and around their, the Christian churches. Um, and if we saw something like this at a church uh, in America from hundreds of years later, we would rightly suspect that this was... Uh, a cemetery, um, and that these were headstones to demarcate uh, the burial site uh, of an individual who was a member of that church. Well, in the original form, these high crosses were dedicated to families. They might even, and many of them have the, the name of the family who had dedicated that cross to the church, but they don't mark a burial site. And that's one of the, the significant differences, um, that this was not about um, marking a, a place of burial. This was about showing that that family was Christian and that they supported that church through uh, their not only their belief, but their, um, their commissioning of these decorative objects. Um, and so the objects themselves, over time, might be added to, you can see, uh, that the base could change because it's not a solid form. There's a joint between the cross. The cross is inset into the base. So if a new generation wants to uh, augment or um, you know, to add to their family's cross outside the church, they could ha commission a new base. They could commission a new capstone or finial. Um, so the point is, is that that allowed for um, some individual expression, family to family, and also some kind of competition. So if 
my family's cross is not as tall as yours. I can have a new base added or a new element to the base to make it taller or more impressive. Now, on the exterior of the crosses, uh, the decoration, the relief carving tends to be the same or similar, at least in subject matter from cross to cross. We see in the, the panels around, in and around the cross, we see the story of Christ's arrest, his betrayal, his, uh, um, his flagellation, and his crucifixion, and then ultimately his resurrection. Uh, now, that, that was a, uh, an important part of the story, um, that they wanted to show the sequence of Jesus' last days um, to show that, that this cross represents the sacrifice of Christ, um, and also it represents the the family's belief in Christ's resurrection and the power of that resurrection. Now, these crosses um, were mostly carved in limestone, um, but some used just local stone. These were not um, these were not made by overly wealthy people or nobility. These were uh, a way that kind of a normal family over time could show their connection. Um, and that's an important part of this culture because for these people, your, your family affiliation, your, your family connections, uh, your family traditions were most important. And so, you know, they, they would have taken, uh, you know, this very seriously as a, uh, a sign, a visual sign uh, of their family traditions. And so, you know, your family's cross um, was a, a, augmenting it, adding to it, uh, you know, was a, a, a very important part of your, um, of your, your relationship with your society and community. Now, in, uh, in Scandinavia, the traditions, again, a unique tradition to the place, uh, somewhat dictated by the, um, this, by the, the climate, and the weather, and their traditions. Um, this is what's called a portal entry, a portal door. Um, it's very cold there much of the year, snows, ices heavily. Um, and as such, the doors were and are narrower. Um, you know, the, the less time it takes and the less open the door is, the less the cold gets in. And so the doors are narrower, but the surround around the door, the carved surround or frame around the door, um, was a way to kind of add decorative elements to your architecture. And so they incorporated uh, not quite the same level of intricacy of the as the Celtic uh, knots, but some of the same motifs, abstracted animal forms, uh, intricate line work and detailed in, in the carving. Um, and so, you know, it's, we see some consistency in terms of, uh, of, of themes, but, uh, you know, each individual culture applies it slightly differently. Now, um, as the medieval tradition of manuscript illumination evolved over time, uh, there, the, uh, the level of skill that exhibited by these illuminators was um, was developing because the way that uh, that illumination or illuminators worked was that um, they would take on apprentices, and in order to become a master illuminator, you had to spend several years apprenticed to a master, uh, and then develop your skills to the point where you could. Uh, you were labeled yourself as a master. So uh, we're going to look at a couple of books, um, the two finest examples, really, uh, from the time period. One is called the Book of Duro, and then we'll look at the Book of Kells. Now, each of these were made by master illuminators. Um, there's a couple of different explanations as to who, the, uh, who these illuminators were and why they made these books. A couple theories. 
Um, but, but they both show off kind of the highest level of quality of the skill of their design work of their, um, their illuminations. So this is a carpet page from the Book of Duro. Um, the, those white areas are the discoloration and, and the deterioration of the pages. Um, these books were made primarily uh, on pages made from vellum, which is, which is treated and pounded animal skins. Um, and they were made with inks that uh, had, had natural elements. Um, and so as such, over time, uh, they have deteriorated, and uh, today they're they're very very carefully preserved. Um, the but what's uh, what's amazing about the books, first of all, that they survived at all. Uh, it's a, they, there's no, you know, there's there's very little um, examples of books like these, especially these elaborate manuscripts that have survived. Now. Um, we believe that both of these books were, in a way, the uh, a, a, t a sample book, like we discussed, because um, to to sh have a single book that was uh, so elaborate would have been so expensive and taken so long to complete that odds are that no one, you know, none of the patrons would have invested in a book like this because it just would have been far too expensive um, and taken too long to complete. We think that both of these books were executed over many years um, and again as idea books and sample books and to show what the illuminator was capable of. Now um, these are both, neither of these are, actually, are very large books um, and as such we see um, that the illuminations, the designs are incredibly intricate to the point where um, each uh, you know, each artist who they made their own brushes, they made their own materials, and there's there's stories that and evidence that they had brushes as fine as a single hair. So that allowed for these incredibly intricate line work, incredibly intricate design, but it required a tremendous amount of control from the artist to be able to uh, execute a vision with such a, uh, a small uh, instrument. Now, this is a variation on a carpet page and you can see when even the even though the resolution is poor you can see when you get very very close up to the, the uh, to the, the illumination you can just see how just how fine the detail work is. Um, now, the coloring has changed slightly as they've developed more and more natural pigments for inks and for coloring those inks. Um, the, in previous generations, uh, the, there was a limited color palette, um, but we're going to start to see that evolve as artists uh, explore different uh, pigments for used for coloring. This is perhaps the most intricate uh, illuminated manuscript page ever made is from the book of Kells and um, it is it's almost absurd in its level of intricacy um, you there's so many things at work here in the design that the closer and closer you get the finer you get to the detail um, you just keep seeing uh, more and more um, elaborate design. It's a, a really remarkable f work. The Book of Kells as a whole uh, is just really shows off the incredibly high level of uh, skill in the, this, these master, this master illuminator. There, um, now because these aren't, they're, they're called identified as books rather than as Gospels or Virgils because they really weren't um, religious text. They, they just were examples of the different types of illuminations possible. Um, in the Book of Kells, we see uh, a variety of illuminations. We see, um, you know, this is uh, an image of uh, Christ 
and he's seated on his throne, and he's holding uh, a book, ostensibly the Bible, uh, and he's surrounded by his angels uh, and peacocks, which were a symbol of kingly authority. Kings kept peacocks. Um, and then around that, you see this incredibly elaborate framework uh, of you know, Celtic knots and the repetitive pattern uh, of this really you know, far too elaborate frame. Um, there's not a high level of realism in the form, in the figure, um, partly because that uh, the use of modeling was no longer um, part of that visual tradition. It'll make its way back as we move towards the Gothic. Uh, it's, it, the images tended to be flat and graphic rather than using light and dark to create the uh, illusion of depth. Now, these manuscripts, um, you know, sometimes they're, they tell us stories that we're kind of familiar with, and sometimes um, it's a, a slight variation on a story that we might be less familiar with. Um, but the themes are, were, were important to the period. Um, you know, as they, they endeavored, these missionaries endeavored to, uh, um, to convert the people uh, who had been pagan. One of the most important um, supports to the claim of Christ and his power was his power over life and death, to bring himself back from the dead and that he would then return at some point in the near future to judge, um, and that the uh, image of Christ's second coming was a recurring theme and an important theme in the time period. And that's what you see here. Christ is um, judging. He's returned in judgment, and you see the uh, he's giving over to that black angel of death there, the demon. He's giving over the, the soul's of those deemed unworthy. So it's it's images like this one that would have been um, useful in manuscripts, and as such, um, that's why he incorporates them, the Master Illuminator incorporates them into his uh, example book. Now, as we move further into the medieval, what we're going to see is uh, a transition in terms of subject matter and themes um, and the development of that uh, throughout the medieval period uh, towards, um, in support of the, the church's mission. Um, and w so the empire is, uh, is, has, is long since gone at this point. Um, and as, it tra as we see a transition away from a, 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 a central government and central authority in an empire to more individual um, government, we'll see how culture responds um, and the church's influence in terms of subject matter and narrative becomes more and more important. All right, so look for future videos coming soon.